You're listening to Innovators, the podcast from Harris Search Associates, where we speak with global leaders in education, research, engineering, and the health sciences, and ask them to share lessons learned as they continue to advance the frontiers of innovation and discovery. Today's podcast will be led by Rick Skinner, Senior Consultant. This is the first of a series of innovators podcasts devoted to the state of pediatric research, its relationship with children's hospitals, and the type of leadership called for by both the research and hospital organizations. In the May 2017 issue of the journal Pediatrics, three researchers, Tina Ling, Clifford Boat, and George Dover, forecast seven great pediatric research achievements that they thought would come about in a not too distant future. The forecast was based on responses to an open-ended survey from pediatricians who are also professional board members. The authors acknowledge the intellectual risk of such an undertaking, even if drawing on the views of experts in the field of pediatric research. They are far more good historians than there are prophets, they noted, if only because most people are epistemological conservatives and tend to predict the future as an extension of the recent past and immediate present. Nevertheless, Ching, Bogue, and Dover hazarded the following seven promising areas of research on the verge of breakthroughs that will impact the health of children, adolescents, adults, and communities. One, more pediatric immunizations prevent emerging and persistent diseases. Two, cancer immunotherapy in pediatrics shows promise. Three, genomic discoveries predict, prevent, and more effectively treat diseases. Four, Big life course data recognize fetal and childhood origins of adult health and disease, resulting in effective early intervention. Five, knowledge of the interaction of biology and the physical and social environment leads to effective prevention for individual and population health. And six, quality improvement of science creates safe, efficient systems of care. And finally, seven, Implementation and dissemination research reduces global poverty. In this and future innovators interviews, we ask persons steeped in the worlds of pediatric research and children's hospitals to provide their respective assessment of the progress made or delayed in the seven achievements. And in the process, we seek to understand the role leadership plays in administering the organizations that are the home to children's research and care. We begin our series with Dr. Mark Batshaw, Executive Vice President, Physician-in-Chief, and Chief Academic Officer at Children's National Hospital. He is also Director of Children's National Research Institute at CNMC, as well as Professor in the Department of Pediatrics at George Washington University. He earned his BA from the University of Pennsylvania, his medical degree from the University of Chicago, completed his residency at the University of Toronto, as well as a fellowship in developmental pediatrics at Johns Hopkins. He has served on the faculties of Johns Hopkins and the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Batshaw is particularly well suited to assess the progress in pediatric research, the role of children's hospitals and the sorts of leaders needed to facilitate progress in pediatric research, as well as children's treatment and care. A paragraph from an article he co-authored in 2014 captures his special perspective. The acceleration of clinical trials studying rare diseases over the past three decades has occurred largely because of the Orphan Drug Act, which was enacted in 1983 as a result of patient advocacy groups working with congressional sponsors. This act facilitated the development and commercialization of products, drugs, vaccines, and diagnostic agents to treat populations with rare diseases defined as those affecting fewer than 200,000 US residents, or those without reasonable expectation that drug development costs will be recoverable by US sales. The act has resulted in more than 3,900 orphan product designation requests to the US Food and Drug Administration, FDA, with the approval of more than 450 products to treat approximately 250 rare disorders of which approximately one quarter in the past decade have been for pediatric diseases. Welcome to Innovators. In the excerpt I just read you, you and your co-authors had the advantage of three decades with which to assess progress in pediatric research. 
Today, I'm only going to give you a scant four years as bases from which to assess progress in those seven areas of research. If you don't mind, even though I put you at something of a disadvantage, could you cite for us one or more of those seven fields that from your perspective, there's been substantial progress made in those areas for which, for whatever reason, and we'll come to that, they haven't made nearly as much progress. Sure, thank you for asking. I think one of the areas that has made significant uh, progress is broadly called precision medicine mm -hmm. or genomic medicine. Mm -hmm. And in the context of pediatrics, two of the largest areas are gene therapy mm -hmm. and uh, cellular immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. Gene therapy uh, basically is the idea that you would insert a gene into uh, the person, the child's body, mm -hmm. to either replace something that's missing or else to uh, modify uh, something using gene mm -hmm. editing, mm -hmm. as an example, yep. uh, or to fight cancer. This idea of gene therapy has been around for at least 30 years. Exactly. Frankly, there was a great deal of hype about it uh, especially in the early 1990s. Mm -hmm. I remember mm -hmm. an issue of Time magazine exactly. from 1990 mm -hmm. that focused entirely on gene therapy. It was the and cover of, course, of, the, of the issue, if I remember correctly. Right, exactly. Yeah. It was the cover of the issue. And then, you know, in the late 1990s, there was the uh, death of Jesse Gelsinger. Mm -hmm. That really had a significant impact on the field. And, and then uh, even after the field started coming back, it took a while for the technology to advance, hmm. to develop the correct uh, vectors that mm -hmm. would serve as a taxi to get yes. the mm -hmm. gene in. But over the last uh, three to four years, mm -hmm. there have been some notable successes, starting uh, with uh, the treatment of an eye disorder that causes mm -hmm. blindness. Mm -hmm. Most of these have been rare genetic diseases mm -hmm. in children mm -hmm. that have been uh, successful. Perhaps the most important one recently is uh, spinal muscular atrophy, which is a oh. neuromuscular disorder of infants that has in the past led rapidly to death. Yes. And now with gene therapy, uh, if instituted early enough, uh, can be uh, life-saving, uh, and th these children can really do wow. very well. And there are, there are literally hundreds of clinical trials in gene therapy that are mm -hmm. ongoing in, uh, in children around cancer and rare genetic diseases primarily, so that I think it is likely that there are going to be many other successes coming from that. Technology had to catch up is what I think I hear you saying is that despite the advances in the genome and everything, the technology was not prepared for the kind of advances that it made, especially that, that the spinal one strikes me as a particular one that uh, it, it's interesting that it took a while. And I gather the speed now has momentum. So that field is progressing fairly rapidly. Yes, the field is progressing rapidly because the vectors are now much safer mm -hmm. than the vectors that were used before. Mm -hmm. And the, the mechanisms of administration are uh, better as well. So it's like most things that you have a, a wonderful idea, but uh, it takes time to develop the technology yep. to work out uh, the uh, side effects mm -hmm. um, and to finally be successful. The, the second example is, mm -hmm. uh, cellular immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea of uh, basically taking cells and uh, teaching them uh, through genetic mechanisms mm -hmm. to uh, fight infections or, or to have an impact on cancer. And this too has had a significant impact on, uh, for example, acute lymphoblastic exactly. leukemia mm -hmm. in children, which is one of the most uh, common cancers. Mm -hmm. uh, when I started out uh, in medicine uh, almost 50 years ago, when you had ALL as a child, 90% would, would die. 
Yeah. Now things have changed enormously since that time so that now the vast majority of children with ALL will survive. Uh, and there, there is many different approaches to chemotherapy and radiation therapy that is mm -hmm. helpful. But there are still children who are at risk uh, of not surviving as a result of that. And here, cellular immunotherapy may be very helpful, especially with side effects that may come from the therapy, there. such as mm -hmm. placing them at uh, greater risk for viral uh, illnesses yes. that can be counteracted by that. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the, the idea of precision medicine, where you know what the specific uh, genetic defect is, mm -hmm. and you can then design therapy around it, has really made a marked advance. And it all started actually with breast cancer, which of course doesn't occur in children. Really? Because 20 years ago, uh, they discovered a gene called the HERS gene. And it mm -hmm. turned out that women whose breast cancer manifested the HERS gene were not responsive to the um, approach to therapy, the estrogen Mm -hmm. uh, uh, approach to therapy mm -hmm. that the HERS negative were. So mm -hmm. after that time, all women who had breast cancer would be tested for the HERS yes. gene yes. and yes. their treatment would be designed based on whether they were HERS positive or, or negative. That was the first approach to precision medicine. And I think more and more, we're going to discover that precision medicine is going to be helpful for children uh, moving forward in many, many different diseases, because diseases are not monolithic. They all have uh, differences in them. And if we understand those genetic differences or how environment is mm -hmm. interacting with genetics, we'll be able to do a much better job of designing therapy that is more effective and has uh, fewer uh, side effects. If I could, one quick question going back to the technology. Is it possible now that the kind of computing technology you need for some of this work is now on a desktop computer? Because I remember in the early days when after the genome, you really had to have a supercomputer to do it. it was, there was no other alternative. And so not everybody could go out and buy a supercomputer. Has the, has the technology now both shrunk in size, but left the power and at the same time made it more possible for more researchers to do the kind of research you're talking about. Yes, it has not become simpler, but right. we now have the cloud. Ah. And, so, uh, and so a simple computer can access the, exactly. the cloud and the cloud has the super computing <laughs> so opportunity the that you can buy that will allow you to, uh, uh, to analyze the yep. uh, uh, terabytes of material in uh, single genome analysis. So, so literally a, a researcher anywhere with access to the web now can begin to do the kind of exploration we're talking about. You are now talking about that being capable just about anywhere, albeit the genetic testing still is going to be a bit of a logistics challenge as much as any. If you think about the human genome uh, yes. and when uh, it was uh, identified uh, in uh, 1983. The cost of that uh, was, if I remember, over a billion dollars, billion dollars. a single uh, genome. One. And it took uh, a couple of years to do it. Exactly. Now, a graduate student in any <laughs> laboratory uh, can do it in a matter of days and at a cost of less than a thousand dollars. So Moore's Amazing. Law, you know, which, which predicted exactly in computing the, happened. the decrease in cost uh, has been uh, more than found to be the case uh, in genomics. Now, we talked about the ones that have made some substantial progress. Are there others that have, for whatever reason, and we'll come to the reasons perhaps in a minute, but are there some fields of endeavor that was talked about in the 2017 article that have simply not moved qu as quickly Sure, and, and that's, in my view, it's the implementation and dissemination research to reduce global mm -hmm. poverty and mm -hmm. all of the childhood illnesses that result from mm -hmm. uh, poverty. 
uh, I, I, I don't want to take the approach that it's intractable. And I think things like President Biden's administration in, in giving $1,400 uh, mm-hmm. checks uh, for, for mm-hmm. children who, who live in poverty will be, a, a, if you will, a natural experiment to see mm-hmm. if as we pull children out of poverty, uh, will that make a difference in their, in their lifespan? And I, I believe it will. The issue of stress, psychological mm-hmm. stress, mm-hmm. mothers when they're pregnant has been shown to exactly. have a lifelong effect mm-hmm. on their future children mm-hmm. in terms of obesity, cardiovascular disease, even, you know, while they're a fetus, it's going to modify their, their genome in a way mm-hmm. that places them at, at risk. At risk. You know, it's one thing for us to be able to uh, potentially cure rare genetic diseases with gene therapy. Mm-hmm. But, you know, here, there you're talking about curing hundreds or maybe even thousands of children. Mm-hmm. If we can get a handle on the effects of poverty, you're talking about millions and a billion children in the world. So it, it's difficult, but it doesn't mean that we should stop trying to make progress in that Your area. Your point's well taken. I, I recall, uh, I guess this was in the early part of the century, being in a graduate seminar and, and a student pointing out really quite livid in a very, very vivid way that we had reached the point in, in the world that we actually could, we had the capacity to feed everyone. Now, there were reasons we don't, but those reasons were not for lack of supply that was there. Now the question is with this $1,400, which is un, unprecedented uh, in American history, we have the chance perhaps of bringing to bear, as you say, in a natural experiment, if you will, the possibility of at least reducing hunger perhaps reducing ill. And then as you point out, I think you're right, we would be able to take some diseases that we know afflict thousands, if not millions of people. So that that's fascinating. Any other field that you see has not moved forward quite as well? Well, the whole issue of quality improvement, yep. uh, you know, the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy mm-hmm. of Medicine, mm-hmm. Uh, produced the monograph to Errors Human mm-hmm. back in, I think, 1990, and mm-hmm. showing that hundreds of thousands of people were dying in hospitals uh, because of, uh, of uh, errors, uh, mm-hmm. human errors in provision of care. I actually think we've come a, a long way in, in, since that time, but still mistakes are being made. And I mm-hmm. think this is an area where the electronic uh, medical record and other IT solutions that can can help physicians and nurses and other healthcare Mm -hmm. providers catch errors before they come to the the patient uh, side really has potential for the future. Mm -hmm. But it, it hasn't gotten there quite yet. And I think it's because the electronic medical record is only a a decade or so old mm-hmm. in terms of being generally utilized. Mm-hmm. So I think that's going to happen, but it hasn't happened as fast as we hoped or it should have. It, it, some part of that has to do, I suspect, with capacity, not just the, the resources, but it's an extraordinary task to take on when you're starting with no digital information really at all. So in certain countries, in certain parts of the world, that's even going to be a challenge there, even with the funds. One of the exciting things is the idea of data lakes. Yes. The idea of of not just having the information from the uh, EMR, the electronic Mm -hmm. medical health uh, record from your institution, but from hundreds of institutions. And because the two largest EMR systems, uh, Epic and Epic and Sterner, have millions of children, mm-hmm. if you will, in their in their records. the The idea of our being able to interrogate these data lakes to uh, perform health services research mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and answer some of these important quality questions, I think, is going to explode in the next decade. It sounds like a classic opportunity for data mining 
to go in yeah. with that much information. And as you say, the two providers, the, the primary vendors for this product, really the, the differences between them are at times substantial, but they're still, they're interoperable in another respect. So it opens up some possibility. I guess the question that I, I like to pose to you is when you look at the progress and when you look at the lack of progress, any common factors there? Is it uh, a lack of resources? Is money the problem? What's making things work on the one hand and what's slowing things down on the other in your mind? It's, it's sort of generic factors. Well, I think it's easier to manipulate things in the laboratory than it is in society. We don't do field studies very well. Let's talk a little bit about the whole question of the role of children's hospitals. They are at once a laboratory. They are also a place that treatment and clinical activities have to take place. You have a unique experience where you are. You, you are both the hospital and the research activity bound together through legal mechanisms. How much difference does it make that relationship between the children's hospital and a research enterprise? And I won't define the research enterprise any further. It may be a university or it might be something else, a drug company, whatever. How much difference does it make in the formal relationship between researchers and the children's hospital? But also, what kind of culture facilitates overcoming any sort of challenges having to do with the structure? So I think um, children's hospitals are unique and precious uh, quantities. Uh, fortunately, most of our uh, major cities uh, have a children's mm -hmm. hospital and most of the children's hospitals are academic medical centers. Mm -hmm. and they do both clinical work and uh, research uh, work. And I think that's, that's really essential. We have uh, five clinical centers and five research centers and they connect to each other. So we have a clinical cancer center mm -hmm. and a research cancer center mm -hmm. and a surgery clinical center and a biomedical engineering center mm -hmm. to develop devices for surgery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's really important for the two to interact closely with each other. And we have about 900 physicians at mm -hmm. Children's National in Washington, D.C. And of those, about 250 are also principal investigators oh. in research studies. So they have one foot mm -hmm. in uh, the clinic and mm -hmm. one foot in, in research. Mm -hmm. And some of that research is laboratory research and others of it is clinical research mm -hmm. and others is community research. And we need all of that. And it's that unique quality of the children's hospital where we're all kids all the time trying to make them healthy, healthier and stronger. That is, is a unique quality. And research is so tremendously important part of what we do. And the culture, as you well know, in, in many universities, there's some tension sometimes about culture, the culture of research and scholarship and the culture of teaching as well as service. Is there a culture that from your perspective develops relatively easily early on, or is it something that takes a long amount of time? I think it does take a while. Uh, when you're talking about changes in culture, mm -hmm. you have to either teach the people who are there a new culture or bring mm -hmm. in uh, new people who already mm -hmm. have that culture or some mm -hmm. combination uh, of the two. But it's really mission driven. If you have an institution whose mission is to help children and to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion, if that's part of your culture, then research becomes very much part of everything you do. Mm -hmm. And it's not just research, it's research and training, because it's also ah. a responsibility of the children's hospital to teach the next generation Excellent. of practitioners. Very and about point. half of the practitioners in pediatrics are trained at children's hospitals. Half? Yes, about half. So a substantial number of people who come into the field will come into it ready to do research in and of by itself. They would need nothing. 
they would expect that culture and the structure and the organization to sort of accommodate that. Is yes. there ever a case that you, that you, where the competition between the clinical side, especially when it comes to revenues and finances, where that competes in some way with the research, those situations arise seemingly more now. And I'm not sure exactly how that came about. Well, you know, I think COVID is a perfect example of that because all hospitals have been suffering uh, exactly. greatly from, from COVID. And even with the wonderful support that the federal government has, has given, mm -hmm. uh, most hospitals are not doing well financially. And I can only speak for our hospital, but our uh, CEO and leadership has at Children's National has continued to support the academic mission of research and education during these difficult times, because they realize that if you don't have academics, you're not gonna be providing the cutting edge care mm -hmm. that a children's hospital should be doing. Mm -hmm. And you're not gonna be preparing for the future. And I think you touched on the next matter I wanted to bring up. Now, this is, this is a double edged sword, I guess, in some ways, because you are one of the executives of Children's National. The nature of leadership is always talked about whenever you begin exploring an area that's particularly important and in some cases very spectacular in what they do. But more often than not, we find that leadership could begin in many cases way beyond the time it hit the headlines and made the news and so forth. What's the nature of leadership in these two entities that, as you say, they sometimes bridge one another quite well What's the nature of leadership in it? And, and in particular, how does it affect the ongoing ability to come up with innovation, new discoveries and the like? Is it the case that if you could bring somebody in from uh, another industry who has strong administrative skills, but perhaps doesn't know medicine very well or doesn't know that, they can still run the organization? Or is it in fact the case that it's pretty hard for someone to come into an environment that fosters both kinds of activities, care, treatment, and research, that's going to take an expertise. Who comes into these positions? What do they have as a real impact on what those units do? I, I see a couple of tenants that are important in, in leadership. One, I do believe in the great person theory. Uh, I believe that there are certain times in the life of an institution when the leader, she or he, uh, has to have a special skill set that is going to save that institution, that's going to make it go forward. Number one, I, I think you need a, a very special person. Number two, that person needs to have a vision, not a hallucination, but, but a vision. <laughs> um, and, and number three, they have to have the resources so that they have the potential to be successful, the financial resources, the personnel resources. And then lastly, I think they have to be an honorable person. They have to be someone who people trust, someone who can get things done because people will take a chance uh, with them. Now, whether they need to come from the medical environment, I think mm -hmm. really, depends on what the, the leadership position actually is. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, being a, a CEO of a healthcare system, there are so many unique parts mm -hmm. of the healthcare system mm -hmm. that I think you have to have some sort of training in that area. I yep. think you need to be either have a clinical background or a background in healthcare administration mm -hmm. uh, as a CEO, at least, maybe not for mm -hmm. the FO. So I, I do think that, that there are special uh, needs in terms of prior training and experience. And as you think about the next 10, 20 years, is it the case that, as you point out, COVID has really had, in many cases, very severe effects on children's hospitals because they're not going to be, they're not doing work that, for which they'll be reimbursed. Do you see the opportunity there for, I'll just use the, 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 the kind of hackneyed example of, Mr. Gro Leslie Grove heading up the atomic bomb. He knew nothing about atoms and he knew nothing about physics at all, but he knew how to run an organization. Are we entering into a time where someone like that might be needed or, or is it the case that in order to make that 
organization healthy again, they're going to have to understand it much better than just having managerial experience. They're going to have to have some substantive knowledge about it. Well, I think there, there are certain geniuses who could probably come in anywhere and could make things better. I mean, Bill Gates is a perfect example of someone who did not come from the healthcare mm -hmm. environment, and yet his exactly. work internationally to improve healthcare, you know, has been just phenomenal. Extraordinary. I want to ask a final question, and it asks for a little bit of historical perspective again. In a February issue of the Journal of American Medical Association, there's a wonderful line that starts, it says, the great scientific achievement of 2020 was the development, testing, and approval of numerous vaccines in less than one year, the COVID. But 65 years earlier, there was another one that was almost as revolutionary. And that was the SALT vaccine was heralded as probably one of the greatest achievements of the 20th century, not only because it dealt with a horrible disease, but because it opened up a whole new way in which we could begin to explore. Those are two events that long after you and I are around that, that people will be talking about. What are the lessons that we need to learn from those two as it relates both to the research enterprise as, and to the way in which children's hospitals deliver care? Well, you know, I actually remember the time of the Sabin. I, I, do. I was five years old in uh, mm -hmm. 1950 when mm -hmm. uh, and lived in Atlanta, Georgia, where there was an epidemic. And uh, my parents drove us to Panama City, Florida on the Panhandle uh, for, for, for three months. For me, the, the memory was a very positive one because I had my parents with me <laughs> the whole time I was on the sand. And then all it cost me was a jab in the arm at the end of it all when, when the vaccine came. You would have done it four and or five times. Then. I, I would have. Um, the idea of using this mRNA approach uh, towards uh, vaccines for the COVID, uh, both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines use this, was the first time it, it has been used in vaccine development. And it's going to transform the future mm -hmm. of vaccine uh, development. But it couldn't have happened had it not been for the genome study that allowed mm -hmm. us within days to know the uh, genetic composition mm -hmm of the virus, and then mm -hmm. to be able to develop the mRNA, which uh, basically is the cookbook for the uh, production of the, vi uh, the virus protein, uh, the spike protein that, that, that's used for the, the vaccine. So that it didn't just happen by itself. It, there were years and years yes. of preliminary work that led to it. And the same was true with the polio vaccine. Exactly. Sudden advances aren't really sudden. They're really based on knowledge that has been gained over time and then being used. We all stand on the shoulders, shoulders of giants who uh, went before us. I have, to, I have to make a note there. Some years ago, I was interviewing someone who was just an amazing researcher. But he said, you know, in many ways, the research that we do, and in his field is in biochemistry, he said, we're sort of like icebergs. What you see is just the tip. And there are, in some cases, hundreds and thousands of meters below that. There's a lot of research that's gone on unnoticed and probably not as appreciated as it should be. Which leads me to, to close today by observing something. You are a very youthful 75-year-old fellow. I think it, it's not known that uh, someone like you who has had a remarkable career has never lost sight of the devotion to serving children suffering from diseases that in many cases probably are said, well, that's just the way life is going to be. You've never accepted that. And so I'd like to just acknowledge and recognize you for the extraordinary work you do. We have, an, we have a signed agreement that you say, well, you will continue for another 75 years, which you can sign at any time. But most of all, I wanna thank you very, very much and wish you the very best. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking to you. Dr. Batshaw inadvertently dated the human genome to 1983. Upon reviewing this recording, he noted the correct date is 2003. Thank you for listening to Innovators, a production of Harris Search Associates. 
We'll have more insightful conversations with global thought leaders to follow.